Welcome to Audit the Audit, where we sort out the who and what and the right and wrong of police interactions. This episode covers plainclothes officers, reasonable suspicion, and de facto arrests, and is brought to us by Lackluster's channel. Be sure to check out the description below and give them the credit that they deserve. On July 29th, 2020, photographer and self-proclaimed gadfly journalist Sean Thomas delivered four affidavits to the New York Police Department Transit District 11 station, which were accepted by desk officer Geraldine Diaz without incident. Approximately four months later, on December 2nd, 2020, Mr. Thomas returned to the station to deliver another affidavit to Officer Mohammed Ashraf, which was contained in an unsealed standard manila envelope labeled with Officer Ashraf's name. Thanks. The officer's name is on it. Huh? Where's it coming from? What? It's for the officer. Just hand it to the officer. Yeah, but who are you? Who are you? Are? I'm delivering. Just the messenger. Yo, yo. Yo. Come over here. Don't put your hands on me, man. Yo, they told you to stop. I don't give a... Don't put they your hands tell you to on stop. Me. I don't care. You don't put you your stop. hands on me. You don't put your they hands on me. They tell you to me. stop, right? As Mr. Thomas is leaving the police station, a plainclothes officer grabs his arm and orders him to stop without identifying himself as a police officer. As the name suggests, plainclothes officers are police officers who wear regular civilian clothing instead of a police uniform. While in theory, plainclothes officers can be beneficial because they're able to blend in with the general public and prevent crime proactively, New York has a complicated negative history with plainclothes officers. The NYPD's controversial roving plainclothes anti-crime units were disbanded in 2020 by then Commissioner Dermot Shea after years of civilian complaints that the units regularly used excessive force and disproportionately targeted people of color. According to an article in the New York Times, Commissioner Shea said that, quote, the plainclothes units were part of an outdated policing model that too often seemed to pit officers against the communities they served. Despite the disbandment of the anti-crime units, NYPD continues to use plainclothes officers in its operations. And in early 2022, New York City Mayor, former police officer Eric Adams, vowed to reinstate the anti-crime units in response to escalating gun violence in the city. While, contrary to popular belief, plainclothes officers generally do not have to disclose their status as an officer, even when asked directly, they normally must identify themselves when stopping an individual or otherwise asserting their authority as an officer. As the Seventh Circuit explained in the 2017 case of Dornbos v. City of Chicago, quote, Although some unusual circumstances may justify an officer's failure to identify himself in rare cases, it is generally not reasonable for a plainclothes officer to fail to identify himself when conducting a stop. The court in this case also referred to its 2009 decision of Catlin v. City of Wheaton, where it expressed concern about plainclothes officers failing to identify themselves, but held that, quote, it can be a reasonable tactic where the act of identifying themselves could itself reasonably be thought to have made the situation more dangerous. Here, a court would almost certainly conclude that the plainclothes officer was unreasonable in his failure to identify himself as a police officer before physically seizing Mr. Thomas, as there was no evidence that it would have been dangerous for him to do so. Authority, you got Come here, come here. Sir, come here. Come over here, man. Yo, get your hands come off on. Come on. Hold on, who are you? Come on. Who I'm you? a cop, too. A cop. Oh, I'm identify a cop. yourself. He's a cop, I'm telling you. Identify come yourself. All cops here. All cops here. Get your hands off of me. Don't do that. You, you, we'll put you through. Yeah, right. put me through. Put me put through. through. Put me put through. through. We'll see how that works out. Sit down, no, I'm not. Got, I'm not sitting boy. down. What's I'm not sitting down. That's right. Put me in cuffs. Yeah, put me in cuffs. Yeah, what's going on? You're delivering. Put me in cuffs. You the sergeant? Yeah. You have, you have a. Uh, uh, Listen, put your hands down. Don't right. point at him. You have an obligation to intervene. You, you have an affirmative cuff. obligation. Okay. You got a crime? You, you, you got a crime? I don't know what you handed me. You have an obligation. I don't you know what you handed me. Do you have a crime? We we don't know so you don't know if you have a crime. So you don't know. That's not a reason to detain somebody. Now, why am I being detained? We don't know I want suspicion of the crime. That's not how it works. You get a suspicion okay, of a know. crime, give me the suspicion of the crime. The sergeant informs Mr. Thomas that he is being detained because they do not know what is in the package he delivered. And Mr. Thomas argues that because the officers cannot tell him what crime they suspect him of, they cannot detain him. 
In general, police officers are not required to articulate a specific crime that they suspect an individual of committing in order to detain them. Rather, as the Supreme Court explained in the 2000 case of Illinois v. Wardlow, quote, an officer may, consistent with the Fourth Amendment, conduct a brief investigatory stop when the officer has a reasonable, articulable suspicion that criminal activity is afoot. Reasonable suspicion is a less demanding standard than probable cause, which is the standard that's required to make an arrest. And it requires a showing considerably less than preponderance of the evidence, which is a standard of proof that equates to a likelihood of at least 51%. In the Wardlow case, the court noted that, quote, nervous evasive behavior is a pertinent factor in determining reasonable suspicion, and that lawful conduct that is, quote, ambiguous and susceptible of an innocent explanation can give rise to reasonable suspicion that allows officers to, quote, detain the individuals to resolve the ambiguity. Here, Mr. Thomas was not involved in criminal activity, as it's not illegal to deliver documents to a police station without identifying yourself. Yet, given the low standard of evidence required to conduct a Terry stop, it's still very possible that a court would conclude that the officers had reasonable suspicion to detain and investigate Mr. Thomas. It is highly unusual to deliver an envelope to a police department and refuse to explain what's in it or who you are. And given this evasive behavior, the officers may have suspected that Mr. Thomas was attempting a chemical weapon attack, or that there was some other dangerous substance in the envelope. However, it should be noted that there are also factors that weigh against a finding of reasonable suspicion, such as the fact that the envelope was unsealed and visibly only contained pieces of paper. So it's challenging to predict with any certainty how a court would rule in this situation, particularly because the holding could vary depending on which court reviewed the case. We're gonna check your pockets. Oh, you don't have to say, search yes, my pockets. Yes, 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 you're not custody. Fourth Amendment violation. Yes. I'm in your custody. I'm in your custody. I'm, custody. I'm, custody. I'm, custody. I'm lawfully in your you custody. You know and you have an obligation to be in your personally liable. You who you are. I don't give a who you what you're asking. What obligation am I under to answer your question? All right. So we don't know what's in here. We're asking you what it is. You are the one bringing this here. That's right. Exactly. So that's what, right. Why are you bringing here? We ask the questions here because you came into our place. I'm under no lawful obligation to answer your question. Not, you know I am? What law? Say the law that I'm obligated to answer your you're question. Not, you're not, Set the up and cite it. I'll tell you, it's simple. We brought this here, yeah. we need to know what it is. Okay, fine. What crime have I committed? Huh? What crime have I committed? We're about to find out, I'll tell you that. While Mr. Thomas is in handcuffs, the officers search his pockets and eventually discover a knife. It's important to note that even if the officers had reasonable suspicion to detain Mr. Thomas, returning him to the police station, placing him in handcuffs, and searching his pockets were likely unconstitutional violations of his Fourth Amendment rights. In the 1983 case of Florida v. Royer, the Supreme Court held that, quote, Terry and its progeny created only limited exceptions to the general rule that seizures of the person require probable cause to arrest. Detentions may be investigative, yet violative of the Fourth Amendment, absent probable cause. In the name of investigating a person who is no more than suspected of criminal activity, the police may not carry out a full search of the person, or of his automobile or other effects. Nor may the police seek to verify their suspicions by means that approach the conditions of arrest. In other words, even if officers do not formally arrest an individual, an investigatory stop can ripen into a de facto arrest if the detention is sufficiently intrusive. And, if officers do not have probable cause for an arrest, then a de facto arrest is unconstitutional. As the Second Circuit explained in the 2004 case of U.S. v. Vargas, when determining whether a Terry stop has ripened into a de facto arrest, the Second Circuit, which includes New York, considers, quote, the amount of force used by the police, the need for such force, and the extent to which an individual's freedom of movement was restrained, and in particular, such factors as the number of agents involved, whether the target of the stop was suspected of being armed, the duration of the stop, and the physical treatment of the suspect, including whether or not handcuffs were used. According to NYPD Procedure Number 212-11, although officers may conduct an external frisk for weapons and request consent to search an individual during a Terry stop, they cannot conduct a search without consent. The procedure also states that officers should not transport or otherwise move the suspect from the location where they're stopped unless the suspect consents, or there's an exigency necessitating relocation, such as a hostile crowd or safety threat. 
Although placing a suspect in handcuffs does not automatically transform a Terry stop into an arrest, when combined with the other circumstances of this situation, it is likely that a court would conclude that Mr. Thomas's detention had ripened into de facto arrest, and that because the officers lacked the probable cause needed to arrest Mr. Thomas before finding the knife, their actions violated the Fourth Amendment. That's not how it you works. Can, you you can't don't can't detain sir. somebody and then go on a fishing expedition. You, you can't, uh, you can't just truck. drop a package here and walk out and don't want to answer anything. We got to yeah, know well, what I tell you, you what, you better have a crime. You better have a crime. What is on the line? Line. You better have a we crime. Actually, who you line. are, you, you refuse. I'm under no obligation to answer your question. You what lawful obligation am I under? What, what lawful obligation here. am I under to answer your question? You have a lawful obligation. I concede that. No, okay. what lawful who obligation am I under to answer your question? You want me to accept a packet? Who are you? What lawful obligation am That's I not under to answer your question? That's not I don't know what's this. What, what is this? What is this? Sir, what is this? What open, is this? Open it. I'm not going to open it. I don't know what is it. Where's your ID that you're a delivery person? What obligation am I under the... You're, you're, you're supposed to have your ID. If system. you're a delivery you're person, you're supposed to expose you're your ID. You're a lawful search and seizure. You're party to it. If you... Your if, ass is out. It's all right. This okay, is, I, who's this? As long as you say you, it's all right. You said you have any cash on you. Where's your ID as a delivery person? Where's your ID? You have a, del uh, a delivery ID that you work for a company that you delivery package? I want to see that ID. And I want to call your company and see I who you are. I do not consent to searches and seizures. This is against my will. After the officers completed their search, Mr. Thomas was taken to a holding cell, where he was held for over five hours. After being charged with one count of criminal possession of a weapon, Mr. Thomas was eventually released, and the charge against him was later dropped. On December 7th, 2020, Mr. Thomas filed a formal complaint with the Civilian Complaint Review Board, and on October 13th, 2021, he filed a pro se civil rights lawsuit in the Bronx, New York Supreme Court. As of the date of this episode, both the complaint investigation and the lawsuit are still pending. Overall, the NYPD officers get an F. Because although they may have had reasonable suspicion to detain Mr. Thomas, they maintained a hostile and combative demeanor throughout the interaction, violated several aspects of department policy, and likely subjected Mr. Thomas to an unconstitutional de facto arrest and search. This is a clear instance of the tactics that led to the disbandment of the NYPD's anti-crime units. And these types of unnecessarily aggressive, unconstitutional encounters work to further alienate the department's officers from the community they're sworn to protect. Nearly every action the officers took in this interaction escalated the situation, which caused Mr. Thomas to become more hostile and less cooperative. Policing is most effective when it's a collaborative effort between the police and the individuals that they serve. And when officers violate the rights of citizens in such an open and unapologetic way, they lose the trust and respect of the community. It appears that Mr. Thomas has a legitimate civil rights claim after this encounter, and it'll be interesting to see whether he can succeed without legal representation. Mr. Mr. Thomas gets a B-, minus because although he demonstrated a clear misunderstanding of the concept of reasonable suspicion and maintained a hostile and combative demeanor throughout the encounter, he verbally invoked his right to remain silent, refused to consent to an unconstitutional search, and took appropriate action after the incident by filing a complaint and a civil rights lawsuit. While Mr. Thomas was not legally required to identify himself or answer the NYPD officer's questions, providing a reasonable amount of information in response to the officer's questions was arguably the most productive way to end this encounter without escalation. If Mr. Thomas had simply explained to the officers that he was delivering an affidavit, then he likely could have dispelled their suspicions without having to identify himself. While Mr. Thomas was not responsible for preventing an unconstitutional police escalation, this interaction highlights the notion that uniformly invoking the right to remain silent is not always beneficial, and it can be helpful for citizens to provide limited information to dispel reasonable suspicion in certain circumstances. Another important issue to discuss is the fact that while researching this episode, I discovered a 2016 post on Mr. Thomas's blogspot page suggesting that citizens had the right and duty to kill police officers who violate the Constitution. Constitution. Mr. Thomas has a long history with the NYPD, having been arrested multiple times and subjected to various levels of force while attempting to photograph them. And I understand why he would have a negative view of the police based on these encounters. However, advocating violence against other human beings, including police officers, is never acceptable. And I urge Mr. Thomas to reconsider his position on this issue. Let us know if there is an interaction or legal topic you would like us to discuss in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to check out my second channel for even even more police interaction content.